This is not your mother's middle age. No longer is waking up each day, living the wash, rinse, and repeat cycle acceptable. We have the life lessons, the relationships, the wins, and the losses with which to navigate to our highest self without hesitation and without fear leading the way. We have been there and done that, and so we have so much to offer the world and each other. So join me on this journey speaking to ordinary women doing extraordinary things for new insights, new ideas, new medical breakthroughs, and new life lessons. You will be inspired to find your best life here and now. My name is Wendy Charles McGuire, and this is your Second Wind Podcast. Hello, Second Wind. Today, I have the privilege to share with you the founder and former owner of Think Fun Toys, Andrea Barthello. Think Fun Toys has changed the landscape of games, and Andrea and her husband, Bill, actually built an entire category by developing games that challenge kids on multi-levels, including critical thinking. Andrea even got into the Toy Industry Hall of Fame in 2018. That is so cool. Andrea's story, her second wind, has a little different spin, and I think we can all relate to it. And on a side note, I've known Andrea for a while, and her husband, her whole family, her son, used to teach my kids tennis. They have a place at my same summer house, and Andrea used to bring Think Fun toys like Rush Hour, and oh, they're just some really cool games. I forgot the names. Yeah, all these cool games, and I was loving them because we would drive everywhere and they were great for the car. So I was always having these toys for my kids thinking I was being a good mom um, and making my kids smarter, <laughs> smarter than I was for sure. You were. So welcome Andrea to Second Wind the Podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me. Well, thank you, Wendy. Um, you're a total powerhouse on this. I think you found one of your many callings. So Aww. thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so let's get started because I've been telling people how you have a whole different, kind of different approach with the second wind. And I think it's, it's, it's very refreshing. And I want to share that. So tell us about your second wind. You know, this is my perspective. It's not for everybody, but what I've come to, you know, sort of, prodded by when you called me initially and thinking about a second wind. I hadn't really thought of it that way, but it's, um, it's a wonderful term. And um, it does give you something to sort of think about. Um, I spent, we sold our company in 2017 and I left in the spring of 2018. Um, and that was my choice. I wanted to do that. And at the beginning, I think I did sort of subconsciously feel like, okay, what's next? I, I have these things I'm good at and that I've tweaked and, you know, made plenty of mistakes over the years. And what should I apply them to? You know, love the idea of like, can I help save the world in whatever <laughs> way, you know, that might be helpful. Um, I've been going to the, the main TED conference for many years, since like 2007. And um, I've always been inspired by just being able to soak in what people are doing. But what, what came for me, first of all, was it took a couple years to wind down and to just be still. Um, I'm 65, I've been working pretty much full time since I was 17. Um, went to college and grad school at night and then um, started Think Fun with Bill when we were, I think we were 29, maybe 30. Um, so I, I've just been running, you know, fast, had two children, you know, wonderful big family. And so it really took me a little bit of time to just be still. Um, I, and it, I, now I've, I'm more comfortable with that, let's say. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have a next big thing. Um, people often tell me that I should do X, Y, Z, and maybe I will, maybe I won't. But I think having 
people have this expectation of you, just like when you're little or doing whatever you're doing, I think it has to come from within you. And I don't feel obligated. And I'm sort of getting over the guilt of that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm available. Like, I, I'm available when people want to talk about things, especially young women. And, you know, but I don't even think of it as mentoring. I, I thought about that, Wendy, since we talked. And I think it more of just being supportive uh, and listening mm -hmm. and saying, mm -hmm. this is what I hear you saying, because I have a healthy respect and disrespect for consultants coming in and telling you what to do uh, in your business. Usually, you kind of know what you should be doing. That goes for you, Wendy. You probably know better than anybody what you're trying to do, you know, and cool. honor that. So I ramble a little, but that's, that's kind of... Uh, I'm probably just in flux still, but I don't feel obligated. Yeah. And you were saying that you were feeling pressure from other women to, to have the next thing. Are you, are you going to go buy a boat? Uh, what are you doing next? You know, things like that. And you said you were kind of like getting pressure and you were surprised that other women were the ones giving you the pressure. Yes. And, you know, to be clear, I can tell you none of my good friends who are women ever did that to me because they know me too mm. well. And so that would be from people who really don't know me, but see you from the outside and, you know, their perception of what you've accomplished and who you are. Who, and they really don't know you. I mean, I kind of equate it, Wendy, to, um, you know, like if you're pregnant or if you're if your kids are doing great, you know, a lot of times people, and it's usually other women, I hate to say, say, oh, wait, you know, just wait, wait, it's, it's going to get mm -hmm. bad. They don't say that, but that's the implication. And um, so I, I find it curious that, because I think what it is, it's not people having an expectation of me and what I should do, but somehow trying to lay on you things they've heard or learned, or is it guilt? I don't know. But it's like if somebody doesn't know you that well and they sort of position that, it's like I'm the same person I was before we sold the company. I'm not buying a boat. I don't need a boat. You know, I mean, I have a little <laughs> boat at the lake where we go. Yeah. I mean, our family does. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's just a bit of a, a calm time to be able to focus um, on family. As you know, my father was in the hospital and we had to cancel at least once. And I've always put family first, but I'll tell you now to be able to do that with zero, um, you know, obligations. Well, I have family obligate, not the work thing. It, it's wonderful. It's a privilege and I value it more than anything. Well, and you've always worked so hard. So I'd love to dive back because your history is incredible because you said even as a young child, you always knew you wanted to have your own business. Um, I, I always knew that. And I, I mean, looking back, I see that at the time, because my dad was in the Air Force, I don't think I really knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think probably in my mind at when I was younger, what it meant was I want to be in charge of my own destiny. And I'm sure I didn't even know what that meant, but there was, there was something in me. And I thought about that since we talked, um, I'm always been curious about how things work, mm -hmm. how, how things go from here to there, or, you know, just how things work. And so for me, starting a business was a lot about how do I make things work the way I think they should and in the best of all possible ways. And so I got to do that um, from starting a company from scratch, got to create all the systems, the logistics, the, you know, the, just how things work and how things integrate and how people talk, you know, communicate. Um, and Bill, my husband, uh, is sort of the wacky creative and also, uh, you know, good at many things, a strategist, finance, and all of that. So our skills complemented each other. Yeah, yeah. So let that, you have to talk about how this whole thing started. Cause it was in, you know, like you hear in, you know, the PBS specials and everything founded in their garage, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and you actually, it was the same deal. Cause wasn't your husband working at Bell Labs or something? 
or a friend was? No, so Bill, Bill's father was a Bell Lab scientist and also okay. his brother, Dennis. And so he grew, and then their close family friend named uh, Bill Keister uh, was there. And so he grew up in this environment of um, puzzles that this colleague of his dad's made. And what they were were hands-on experiences of what binary code was. Now that sounds pretty dry. I'm sure I didn't know what binary code was back in the day. But what they were were puzzles that really, in a lot of ways, um, hands-on express what I like, which is how do you get from here to there? How mm -hmm. do you do it efficiently? How do you solve a problem? And I'd had a number of ideas for companies, um, one, you know, a number of them. One of them, because I had worked in a psychiatrist's office, was uh, creating a platform for doctors to start their own practice. Because I recognize that many doctors are not good at business. And so that whole part of what they do uh, is not dissimilar to an artist trying to sell their own art. I think it's you know, to blend those two things is interesting. And I felt my role could be in the how to make it work part. Anyway, Bill and I met each other. We were 29. He had these puzzles, these hands-on, uh, you know, wood and wire things. And we were dating and, I, oh, my company where I worked had bought the company where he worked. And, um, we were like, you know, I said, we could start a business and we'll just make these. So uh, the company we worked for started doing illegal things. I resigned. Bill was fired at the same moment, basically for not cooking the books. And there we went. You know, we were uh, we had just gotten married and we had incorporated the business. But honestly, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, <laughs> we took our sick dog with us to a, a meeting with a venture capitalist. And got some cash, which was amazing because we had, were unprepared. Our dog had been sick all night. And oh my gosh, I don't know. I, it's crazy. So, yeah, we started, you know, I had my first contact management system, which now you have, you know, what is it? Uh, I can't remember the names of them. There's a lot of them out there. Mine was a three by five uh, rest card box <laughs> with. You know, essentially what you do on your computer now, but this was in 1985. Right. right. So um, we just started. We just we just started. And um, it's we look back, I have to say to this day, it's we don't even understand how we did what we did. But I think in a nutshell, we focused on, you know, really high quality products, figuring out how to get them made after we made them. And then we really, you know, we moved on from there. Took us about five years to get profitable. Um, we did end up in the Inc. 500 four years in a row, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and we we built a business that we brought really good things to the world, and we cared uh, tremendously about how they were delivered into your home, Wendy. Um, there would be a bag because I'm like, you know what? Once you open that box. You need somewhere to put this stuff if you're yeah, going to take it on the, the go. Yeah, where are the pieces going to go? There's pieces. It's I always know. Annoying. And we gave, yes, we gave free replacement pieces. You know, so certainly we looked at the numbers and the profitability, but a big part of our focus was the experience, not just of playing the game, but owning it and receiving it. And, you know, I, I really, really paid a lot of attention to to that. And I think we delivered on the promise. So, yeah, it's, it's a miracle. <laughs> it is a miracle. But also, I mean, you started this company from just some stuff in a garage. Yep. Right. And you had the foresight. I don't know. Did, it sounds like Bill just had this stuff and you're like, hey. I think there's something to this. Like you were kind of like the prodder yes. of it. And then, like yeah. And then, but we're always the, the, man, the woman behind the man. And then um, you went from just the two of you and you built this entire organization. Tell us like how you, you went from two people to how many before you sold the company? So we, we went from two people to 40. Mm. Um, we could have easily had more people, but then we wouldn't have been that efficient. So we believed in efficiency. And um, 
a lot, a number of the people, one, one guy, Chris, who's still there. I mean, I knew him when he was eight years old and he came to work with us after college, you know, helping drive the forklift that I was driving. And then we just shared all these and he ended up building the global business. Um, and he's still, he's still there. And so basically it's say 35 years. It doesn't happen overnight. There are many, many twists and turns. I think our ability to do what we did um, certainly was fraught with plenty of setbacks. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what it's just like anything in life, whether you're a kid on a playground or, you know, your mom with kids and you're trying to wrangle them in the store, whatever it is, you just have to be able to think on your feet, um, assess the situation have good people working with you where you can communicate and making sure that people that you work with just because you're the owner and you're at the table, they're not afraid to speak their minds because that's critical. And it takes nurturing to do that depending on, you know, who's on the team. Um, so I think it really is the ability to deal with adversity in whatever way it is. Um, and also to deal with success because you know, a couple times when you have like a big hit and it just takes off for us, that was like, okay, that's great, but that might not happen again that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, keeping your wits about you and, you know, being practical and careful. Um, we never had to lay anybody off. We had a salary freeze once in 2008, 2009. Yeah, you when said two 2008 was a, was a tough time because that's like, yeah. that's the same year we opened our restaurants. That was a, that was a yes. horrible time. <laughs> so tell us how you got through that. Yeah, it was a tough time. I mean, the internet, um, you know, the, um, the economy had just, you know, tanked. Mm -hmm. um, we did just fine through it, um, but it was a matter of all hands on deck and being careful. And I have to tell you when COVID came along, which is a horrible thing. There was a part of me that wanted to be at the table because I love assessing situations and finding ways out of them. Uh, so, but I wasn't, but that's okay. It was very interesting to me when you said, after you sold the company, you would drive by and you would see all the cars in the parking lot. And it, it, you kind of felt this like pang almost that you should, you should be there. And that was tough for you. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, because it's almost like um, there's a, there's a video that was played for the hall of fame that really encapsulated it. It's almost like the company was our first child. I mean, not the same as your child, but it was. And so there was a, there's a lot of nurturing, at least from my perspective um, that went into it. And yeah, I mean, I, I cared. And if I saw that the front of the building like, like was in disarray or too many weeds, you know, actually, I will admit, I, I did stop in one day and say, I'm going to get this taken care of because I can't stand it. And I, I actually just had dinner with um, the CEO of the Robinsberger that bought us. And I told him that story. <laughs> I said, I couldn't help it. I had to go in and say, I'm getting this taken care of because it matters, you know. Um, I don't know if that was met with glee by the office manager or like, oh my God, <laughs> but I don't care. You know, I, I think it matters. It does. It does. So tell us a little bit about what happened after you sold the company. How did that transition go for you? Um, well, it, it happened. Bill and I decided in the fall of uh, 2016 and, um, Everything was wrapped up by the end of September of 2017. And um, there's a, there was a period of about six to nine weeks, I, I'm not sure, of due diligence where uh, you know, a lot of people hearing this will probably know what that is, but it's you know, basically uh, in a very organized fashion, handing over documents so that they can be evaluated before you close. I personally loved that uh, process. Um, too bad, I probably will never do it again, but I learned a lot and it was great. And once it was done, um, I felt just a tremendous amount of satisfaction and 
gratitude that I'd been able to build something with Bill through all the really tough times and come through it and have it land successfully. Um, our kids had not wanted to take it over and that was fine. We had no expectation and the company we sold it to, um, they have the same values and they're much, much bigger um, and they're based in Germany, but they have a US uh, division. So I, did, I felt fantastic, honestly. And then I was there until the spring of 2018. Uh, helping with the transition. So tell me, there was some really interesting things that happened for you while you were developing these games. And you actually, as you're, you were testing them. So back in the day, you would test these games with different kids. And you said there was one particular child and was the game tip over or something like that? And yes, they were filming yes. in the classroom and this particular kid was acting up. To, and that story really made an impression on you. Can you share that story? Yeah, it's so funny. It makes me teary eyed thinking about it, Wendy. Oh. That happened when we talked before, uh, which is fine. So it was a classroom. Um, we, we always... Uh, we're major supporters of teachers and what they're doing and, and providing our, our games at, you know, major discounts and whatever we could do. So in this, this particular case, this little guy, he was probably 10 or 11. And after uh, somehow he'd been sitting there playing with this game tip over. And when the teacher went around to ask the kids what they learned after this session of playing this kid who had been very disruptive, we learned later, um, he stood up, he threw his arm up in the air and he said, I learned that you never give up. Mm. And I mean, to see that, if somebody had told me I would have appreciated to see this kid do that, I was like, wow, that's what we do. And there are hundreds of stories about what our games have done for kids. There's, there's even a kid who is for, has a summer job working on a house renovation we're doing with the with the experience team. And his mom yesterday drove by and said, oh my God, I'm so happy to meet you because my, our son was rudderless until he learned how to play rush hour and he got it. And I'm like, whoa. That's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, it's, not, it's, it's really amazing. And I mean, we definitely uh, created things that uh, were good for the world and that matters to us. And that legacy will go on for a long, long time. So I guess the question is, it was going great. Why sell it? Uh, for me, I had done really everything I wanted to do. And um, we're, our kids, we're starting to have kids. So we had grandchildren and my parents are getting older. But I think really at the core, it's what I said to start. I'd done everything I wanted to do. And it's not that there would not have been anything else to do, but having built something from scratch, every single department, uh, a course along the way with, with wonderful people who came in to work with us. Um, yeah, I felt like I'd run its course and um, I, I just wanted a break. I'd been running hard for a very long time and I felt like I needed a break and I just wanted to kick back. And that is very hard for me, but I, I wanted to do that. You say no now. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that, because I think that's really important for all of us in our second wind that we experience being able to decide what what is important to us. What do we spend our time with? Because time you can never get back. Right. So yep. what what does that look like for you? Um, well, it's interesting again, you know, Wendy, when we first talked, so you got me thinking ever since we first talked about some of this. Um, for example, my close, close friend asked me to be in charge of um, something at the library, the local library. And what I've learned is I don't want to be in charge of anything, mm. but I will volunteer. Like I, I went to the book sale and volunteered. And when I volunteer, like I'm all in. I'm there, I'm there early, I'm there late, I'll do anything, sweep the floor. And I love right now more of a support role um, 
if I'm called on for that. You know, I'll go to a food bank and, and help sort. I just, maybe I want to just step aside and let somebody else be in charge. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, again, you sparked that question in my head, but I'm, I'm, I'm not stressing over trying to figure it out. I'm just noticing. Noticing. I think that's really important. But that's really important as we're in our second win and, and, and looking at life and where we want to be in it at this moment, what's important? What is important? And I think it's important yeah. for us to like actually think about it. And how many of us can slow down long enough to think about it? Exactly. And I think that's, I mean, I certainly having sold a company and being in this, you know, very comfortable position is not something everybody gets to have. And I get that. So I'm appreciative of that every day. And even a renovation that we're doing, I'm like, well, we didn't need to do this. It's this weird, like guilt thing that, that sometimes women, we men too, maybe, I don't know, but feel, but I'm, I'm getting over that. Cause it's like, I get to do this, you know, and I do plenty of good things for the world. Um, yeah, we, it is, it is important to actively think about it and to, and to not let other people put their expectations on you. I think about that with little kids. I think about that with me, you know, uh, listening better and, and, uh, appreciating what people care about. And, you know, if I, if there's some way I can be supportive to people, um, yay, but I mean, one of the things, you know, when you sell a company and people have these ideas, they don't know the facts, they don't know what you got, but they think, you know, you're instantly a bazillionaire or something. Right. And, you know, you're going to move, you're going to, like you said early, buy a boat. Well, I mean, that's just not who we are. We, we're living where we've lived since the 90s. It was my dream house then, it still is. Um, but one thing we did do, because as you can imagine, we value education so much, is we paid off all the student loans of all of our nieces and nephews. Wow. And that was one of the most, I mean, I could tell you, Wendy, when I was doing it and I was online and doing it, just tears running down my eyes because we got to take that pressure off of a bunch of young people. And um, that was a privilege. So that tells you a little bit about where our values are, I think. Um, and I don't know if I've wandered off of your question now. But. No, you haven't at all. No. And that's really important is to do things that, that bring you joy and happiness and, yeah. and helping others that you know get rid of some of that stress. That's amazing. Yeah. How can you not love that? Yeah. What are some Pretty of the bad. major, yeah, what are some <laughs> of the major lessons? Is there like a major lesson that you've learned in all of this that you can share? Something that you're like, ah, okay, I get it now. That's why I did all of this. Well, one lesson I learned, and this would be, this is something when I have, you know, maybe met with uh, people who are starting out a business, et cetera, is that, and I mentioned this before a little bit, um, Consultants can be great. There's no doubt about it because it can give you a perspective you don't have. But what I believe, at least for myself, and this isn't necessarily right for everyone, at the end of the day, no one, no one knows more about what you're trying to do than what you're do, you know, than you do. And we certainly, uh, during my lesson was we would hire people in to think they knew more than we did. And maybe they did in a specific discipline. And, and I'm not talking about all the successful hires. I'm talking about the ones that, you know, maybe weren't the right ones. Um, but when people start trying to tell you what to do or that, like for us, your product should really be in mass market and you need to play the game of discounts and you need to do what everybody else in the toy industry does. You know, we're like, whoa, wait a minute. Why? Why? Why do we need to do that? We're not selling crayons. I mean, not, I'm not dissing crayons. We're not selling commodities. These are patent product that you know have a lot of value it's not just whatever so that that's one thing I think is to kind of trust your gut which is something that builds up 
you know, for all of us in our lives, I mean, it's the thing that tells you not to step out in front of a car because you think there's a car coming, you know, you might be little, but you start to gain those instincts. And I think all of us listening to our instincts, whether it's about parenting or whether it's about a business, you know, read all the books and gather information, but then distill it yourself and trust yourself more than you might think you should. That That's one thing I learned. I, I, um, for me, I think both for Bill and I. Trusting your gut. That's huge. I mean, how many of us, I, I do it too. And I, and I was just telling my daughter yesterday, I was like, yeah, I sit there and I'm like, oh, I want to do this and I want to grow this and I don't know how to do this and blah, 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 blah. And then I start throwing money at it. Right. Oh, who can help me? Who can make this oh, easier yeah. for me? Right. And you start pulling in these people to make your life easier and at an expense too. And then you realize that at, when all is said and done, you know, for example, a letter that I wrote, an email that I wrote got way further than anything a marketing person could do for me. And I'm like, why you bet. do I keep insisting that other people can, can, portray me and, and do me better than I can. Yep. It's so interesting. And I don't know why we do that. Why do we do that? I don't know, Wendy, but I mean, there are times when I, I think it depends on the person. So let's just say you want someone to uh, grow your, you know, presence out there. Mm -hmm. There are people, it's finding the right ones. There are people, you're not going to gain every single skill but you want your voice to be heard. And so there are companies that, I mean, there's a company, my niece and her wife started, well, they were just at, at Pocono. Um, it's called Good and Gold Marketing. And I think they are freaking brilliant because they listen and they take the voice of the people that they're working with and they amplify it. And I, you know, talking about gut, I just have this gut instinct that they are, the best of the best. And they are just, you know, they're growing. They started a couple of years ago. And um, so there are people who can help because certainly I didn't know <clears throat> about factories, you know, but mm -hmm. what it comes down to is trusting your gut to say, yeah, they get me and they're going to help me do what I want to do. Or like some consultants we have, like they take what they do everywhere else and they try to put it on top of you. And that is not okay mm, because you're just, you know, that. like your company or my company, we're different. And we, we are the ones uh, defining the character and the values and the, and so if you get somebody you're working with who actually listens and then can support your stuff, that's different. So it's not completely black and white. But um, it's definitely something I pay a lot more attention to. And I try, and I'm not totally successful, not saying you should, because I, I know a lot, but try to say you should think about, or did you think about this? Or here's, you know, it's a nuance. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I love what you're saying is defining the character, defining what, is, what resonates with you. It's really important. Mm -hmm. If you were to share um, like your mantra now, like how do you start every day now? Would you say, is there, is there something you tell yourself every day now that you're in a totally different realm almost? Um, I, I don't think really, there are a couple things I think about every day. Um, mostly I'm enjoying the spontaneity of not having particular plans. I mean, I'm definitely, um, you know, got the grandma hat on big time, but also, uh, things with my friends that I want to do, but a couple things. And I've, I think I've learned this from my kids more than anything. Um, you know, they might have an experience and I keep reminding myself before I share something, except maybe with like my one or two closest, closest friends, it's not my story to tell. It's something mm -hmm. that goes through my head every day now. And I think what that is, is really honoring, like, I don't want somebody else to tell my story. Um, and it's not my place. 
place to tell a lot of their stories, you know, and, and it may be because something that I think of when they were little, but you know what, maybe as adults, they don't want me to share that. So I'm just kind of more mindful about trying to, I mean, I just went through this whole thing about consultants. So I don't want to be that person who's trying to tell everybody what to do. Um, I am a type A person. I'm always solving the problem in my head, but I can keep that to myself. And um, so that's, that's one thing. And then the other one, I, I read this somewhere. So these are not originally my words. Um, trying to say, do you need to say that? Do you need to say that right now? Do you mm. ever need to say that? And I've just found for where I am in my life, I don't know why, but that kind of goes through my head as a real and I'm, I, I resonate with it. So it's not like somebody told me to think that. It goes back mm -hmm. to like, we're, I, I am my own person, but I kind of resonate with that. Like, yeah, you know, maybe, I, I think what I'm working on the most is being a really good listener, a better mm. listener. I like, I like to make things better. So I guess I'm working on myself now, Wendy. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. I found myself yesterday with my daughter-in-law and my son. They're looking at this house and I was like, oh, well, you could just put some wainscoting here and you could do this yeah. and you could do that. And oh, just some switch plates would change the look of this. And I stopped <laughs> myself. I'm like, Wendy, you are acting like this is your house and you're going to fix it up. And, and why do you have this like stressed out feeling in your stomach that you have to do all these projects to this house when it's not your house, by the way, and no one bugged you when you bought your house, you know, way back when your first home and you had to do it all by yourself. I was in California. My parents were in New Jersey. No one bugged me. So, right. yeah, I love what you just said. That's really important. Keep it to yourself until yeah, you're and it asked. Does. They might ask you. So, like, I, I'll, I'll – uh, that's so funny. If you and I were in that house, however, we could say this stuff to each other because it would be fun. Correct. Yes. <laughs> but not our kids. No. And oh. I try to say to them, you know, do you want my input? Or they – actively ask me what do you think and then of course I engage but I'm with you it's hard because you know we've learned a lot our brains are going and we're like ah blah. so yeah yeah I love that you said that <laughs> that is so cool so I love everything you've done it is amazing that you built this company from nothing from little toys in a games games really in a garage that you gave some credit and credence to and you said okay we can do something with this and it's all in the binary let's 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 change the the whole the whole landscape of what kids have to play with right and and it's just so neat yeah. how you just develop this whole new category and i on a side note i found our old rush hour game and in its little <laughs> bag, all the pieces were together and the, everything was there. And I gave it to um, Lane and Peyton Montgomery, who own Go, Go Performance Gym here with their two sons. And these kids ripped it out and were having the best time trying to figure it out. And then their dad sat in with them and then Frank sat in with them. And, you know, I'm like, I forgot how amazing these games are. Are. And I think every family needs to have these games in their homes. It's so funny you say that. We had we had dinner with somebody once uh, along you know the way, and he said, "I don't think you're a good parent unless you have think fun games in your house." <laughs> Ooh, I love that. It's true though. It's a it's a little it's bit amazing. of there's some truth there. There is some yeah. truth, there. and they're not. And you know, I think they're also. I tried, I tried to develop a line at one point. Um, I think it was ahead of its time. We called it Cortex. I'm not a great name, but our games are good for adults because all the skills you try to learn and develop your brain when you're little, those are the things we're trying to hang on to as we get older. And, mm -hmm. you know, so pretty interesting. Thank you it for is. appreciating them. Absolutely. And Andrea, it has been my pleasure speaking with you today and sharing the story 
on Second Wind. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? You know, I appreciate you reaching out to me, Wendy, because um, you put a lot of thoughts in my head as I, you know, do my little windy road. So I appreciate that. And I really look forward to getting together up at the lake sometime. And um, yeah, and if you come to D.C., you got to let me know. I sure will. Here and we have room. Yeah, no, yes. and I and I really enjoy following. Now I'm I've been listening to more and more of your podcasts. I think it's just wonderful what you're doing. Oh, and, thank uh, you so much. Yeah, I think you have a calling. <laughs> oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I feel that way, and I love sharing the stories. I think there's always something for us to learn. There's always nuggets. Every person that comes on uh, Second Wind has their own little nuggets of of really cool information, even if it's just a word or a sentence that can resonate with so many people. And, and Hey, yeah, I, 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 I can totally relate to that person. And, Oh, there's another way for me to look at that. I, I just, it just is my, it's my joy and my passion to share all that so that we have the information to make great decisions for ourselves and where we want to be and how we're going to get there. So thank you so much, Andrea. And until next time, breathe in your second wind. Thank you for listening today. I hope that something you heard made you smile, made you think, and made you feel. If these incredible stories empowered you, awakened you, or left you feeling inspired, Make sure to share with a friend and write us a review on iTunes so we can continue to change lives through this content. Make sure you tag us while you're listening on our Facebook group, My Second Wind, or hit the link in the show notes to join the conversation. Until next time, go ahead and breathe in your second wind.